Good morning. I'm Joanne Jobin, your Vid Media host. Welcome to the Gold Royalty Quarterly Town Hall Forum. Before we commence, just a reminder that if you do have any questions for the company, please place them into the Q&A tab located at the top of this screen. After the presentation, I will be delighted to moderate submitted questions from our audience. With us this morning is the Gold Royalty team led by Chairman and CEO David Garofalo, who will make the intros to the team and take you through the highlights of the most recent quarterly results. David, the stage is yours. Thank you, Joanne. And good morning, everybody. We're delighted you could join us to talk about our fourth quarter results. I'm joined today by our Chief Financial Officer, Andrew Goebbels, and our Director of Investment Relations and Corporate Development, Peter Benke. And I'll pass it on to them shortly. But I thought what I would do to start the day is talk a little bit about the gold price environment that we find ourselves in. And I think it's been an auspicious start to the year. Uh, many of the themes that we were talking about over the course of 2023 and even before that uh, have really come to pass in terms of a rising gold price in the face of falling real interest rates. Inflation is still quite deeply entrenched. The headline numbers really understate the reality on the ground. Uh, we're not experiencing 3 or 4% inflation. In fact, if you look at our day-to-day -day expenses, whether it's food, fuel, or shelter, and uh, as we see interest rates reset on mortgages, we're seeing 15 to 20% inflation on the ground. And gold is a very accurate barometer of the inflation we're experiencing and where real interest rates lie. Uh, yes, interest rates have stabilized on a normal basis. They have gone up significantly in the last couple of years as the Federal Reserve and other central banks have tightened monetary policy. But the reality is inflation's continued to accelerate. So that's driven real interest rates down deeper and deeper into negative territory. What gold is telling you is the purchasing power of your fiat currencies is steadily being deteriorated through inflation. You're losing your savings through inflation. Gold is the ultimate protector of your capital because it's the one currency can't be printed. And it's telling us that inflation is still undermining the value of our paper currencies and will continue to do so. The Federal Reserve is starting to pivot, or at least signaling that they will, and going to be cutting nominal rates. And I would argue that's actually quite premature. Uh, it's not uh, going to be as a result of inflation coming down. It's because of the onerous debt levels that we've stopped on globally at the government level, corporate level, and individually at 350% debt to GDP. Uh, interest rates right now, nominal rates make debt unserviceable. Uh, there's no fiscally responsible way for these governments to repay the debt. So the central banks are pivoting away uh, from higher interest rates in order to preserve corporate and government balance sheets, not because inflation is slain. That's why we think gold will continue to accelerate. And it's nowhere near the all-time highs for gold on a real basis because you, you look at the last big inflation cycle we had in the 1970s, gold actually peaked close to $3,000 an ounce on a real basis in 2024 dollars. So well away from where the all-time high for gold is. And I would argue that uh, we're going to experience much higher gold prices than we experienced in the last big inflation cycle. Because as I said, the central banks are cutting interest rates prematurely before inflation has actually been tamed. And that will result in unprecedented levels for the gold price. And the question you quite often have to ask yourself is where are you best positioned uh, to get leverage of the gold price? It certainly hasn't been the equities. Um, and, and I know that's disappointing for many gold investors. You would think that you would get leverage from operating companies in a stable cost environment, but we are not in a stable cost environment. So even though gold is up nearly 8% this year to all time highs in US dollar terms, we've actually seen the GDX, which is the large cap producers, uh, see a virtually no change in their equity valuation. So in other words, the gold equities have gone up zero year to date in spite of an 8% increase in the gold price. And that's also true for the juniors. That's not unexpected. The smaller cap names tend to benefit from gold price rallies a little later in the cycle as money starts to trickle down from the larger cap players. But it's telling that the larger cap players in our universe, the producers, are not experiencing any leverage to the gold price. And there really is two distinct reasons for that. One is cost inflation. Uh, they have an overhang in their costs uh, due to inflation in the general economy. They're certainly not immune from inflation and fuel and labor costs. And we're still experiencing that to a great degree. And that's overhung their margins. And so even though the gold price has been going up, their margins continue to be compressed and, and stressed. And the other reason is because the industry continues to shrink. 
because of the lack of capital for the juniors who have not experienced any sort of relief in the face of this gold price rally, we haven't seen any significant expiration in the industry to replace depleting reserves. And so as a result, we've seen a 40% decline in reserves since 2012 uh, among the producers. And we continue to see a cannibalization of the companies within the space. More and more merger activity to sustain unsustainable production levels among the senior companies. The biggest producers in the gold universe, the largest cap names, are producing the same amount of gold today that they did 26, 27 years ago. The big change has been that their share count has gone up exponentially. So in other words, they've had to cannibalize other companies in order to maintain production levels that frankly are unsustainable given the global decline in gold reserves and the lack of expiration activity to replace those depleting reserves. That's why time and again, we've said that the best place to be placed to get optimum leverage of the gold price is among the royalty companies that offer top line exposure while protecting you from inflation. They offer you diversification uh, and they also offer you leverage to the expiration upside of our underlying operating partners. Last year alone, our operators invested over $200 million in expiration on their properties. We contributed nothing to those expiration budgets, but we got all of the upside within our very diversified royalty portfolio of over 240 royalties. And we've actually started to see good financial results uh, in the fourth quarter for the first time in our history. And we've only been in business for a little over three years now. Our anniversary is March 11th since our IPO, third year anniversary since our IPO in March in 2021. And we've already realized uh, a penny of adjusted earnings in the fourth quarter uh, versus a two cent loss on an adjusted basis uh, in the previous fourth quarter of 2022. We did actually book a non-cash impairment of just under $20 million in the fourth quarter. Again, that's an accounting impairment. It doesn't have anything to do with cash on the balance sheet. Really, the biggest chunk of that write-off related to First Majestic's Jarrett Canyon mine, which they suspended operations on last year. We took the conservative view of writing that down to zero, even though First Majestic has been aggressively drilling out that that mine and is looking at ways to bring that back online. So in fact, if they do bring it back online, we'd actually reverse uh, the impairment uh, as a result of that. So we're optimistic that uh, First Majestic will find a plan to, to resume operations there, and then we'll start to get cash flow from that, uh, that operation going forward once they do that. We're poised to deliver very significant growth this year, 100% uh, increase in our revenue versus what we realized in 2023. So a doubling and we've wrung a lot of costs out of our out of our company as a result of the post-merger integration efforts. As you'll recall, we merged with three other companies over the course of 2021. We bought Ely Royalties, Golden Valley Royalties, and Abitibi. And as a result of the, our integration efforts, we wrung almost 40% out of our operating costs last year. And now we've stabilized our cash operating costs about $8 million per annum. So we're in a position now to continue to book positive earnings, we believe, and also positive free cash flow for the first time in our history. So starting to compile cash going forward from our operations. And that's a remarkable achievement for a company that's only three years, three years old. You'll remember when we started uh, our company back uh, at our IPO in March of 2021, we only had 18 royalties. None of them were cash flowing. A significant mineral endowment underlying those 18 royalties, but as a result of our consolidation efforts and the acquisition of some very strong royalties, including Cote in Ontario, uh, Cozumel in Mexico, and Borborema in Brazil, all of which are going to be contributing meaningfully to our revenue growth this year. Uh, we've seen significant revenue growth, and we're forecasting uh, on a consensus basis about 60% compounded annual growth in our revenue right through the end of this decade. And given that our costs are quite stable right now, that means that our revenue uh, growth is going to fall right to the bottom line and continue to compound uh, the increase in our free cash flow going forward. So with that, I'd be delighted to hand it over to Andrew uh, Gubbles to talk about our financial results in the fourth quarter. Thanks, David. Okay, let me start off with um, with the um, the revenue line and and what we've already indicated as as 2024 geo guidance. Um, in 2023, uh, geos of 2,703 ounces were were largely driven by revenue from Canadian Malartic, Borden, 
in Isabella Pearl royalties, um, a partial year of revenue from from Cozumel and um, land agreement proceeds from our, our really our royalty generator business. In 2024, we expect to effectively double our geos and in turn our total revenue, land agreement proceeds, and interest. And that's for for several factors. First, from our existing operations, we see geo enhancement from our operating mining uh, mining partners in areas whereby gold royalty has even more royalty coverage. Um, we see this at, at Borden, Cote, and Odyssey in particular, where operations are actively expanding or transitioning into new areas in the near to medium term. Um, um, also, um, our recent acquisition of Cozumel and Barbarama royalties will provide incremental revenue in 2024 relative to 2023. Um, those are strategic acquisitions that are major contributors to what we'll see in, um, in the coming year, 2024 and beyond. And finally, as I mentioned before, um, our royalty generator business continues to generate new royalties and create um, new sources of, of, of revenue, which is, um, which is in the form of land agreement proceeds for the, uh, for the year. Now, from an operating cost perspective, 2023 was a year whereby gold royalty strengthened its foundation after two years of fast-paced growth via consolidation. Now, this included, as I mentioned before, the strategic acquisitions of two quality cash generating assets in the form of Cozumel and Borborema, uh, but also uh, involved the rationalization of the company's corporate overheads. 2023 saw cash operating costs decrease by, um, by 36% from 12.6 million to 8 million as the company eliminated redundancies, centralized operations, and optimized its service agreements throughout the year. In 2024 and moving forward, we expect recurring operating expenses to be within a similar range as 2023. Taken together with higher revenues, stabilized operating costs, we're confident that our ability to generate positive operating cash flow this fiscal year and beyond. Now beyond 2024, Gold Royalty has an industry-leading growth profile as forecasted by brokers, as you see on this page. So largely be driven by cash flows from projects being developed by large, well-capitalized operators, all of which you know very well. It includes the continued ramp up of Cote Gold, which just started producing, or Minerals Borborema project, whereby we're being currently earning pre-production payments, uh, and Ignico Eagles Odyssey underground operations. Later on in the decade, we do expect to see um, additional growth from high quality royalties, such as Nevada Gold Mines expansion of the Gold Strike deposit, and that's uh, that's a REN royalty. Uh, and we hope to see that later in the decade. Now, with the stabilized cost structure and no exposure to mine operating exploration or development costs. As Dave mentioned before, every dollar of revenue growth goes straight to the bottom line and increases our available cash flow in the future. Now, with that, I'll pass it over to Peter to provide an update on the portfolio. Thanks, Andrew. So building on this pure leading revenue growth chart, uh, diving in a bit to the assets that are, are fueling that growth, uh, I think it's, it's no surprise, and we've shown this image before on the pipeline of assets we have within our portfolio, all the way from cash flowing to early expiration. But what I think is important to highlight is the dynamic nature of this pipeline and specifically the cash flowing bucket of royalties and the work we've done over the last 12 months to focus on supplementing our cash flow profile. Barbarama and Kozman assets both acquired in the second half of 2023 uh, and Cote, uh, an asset that is on, on the precipice of entering production are all going to provide a meaningful portion of our 2024 revenue. Uh, beyond that, within the development bucket, we've seen consistent positive news from our operating partners, advancing those assets towards production. And like Cote, we're, we're quite optimistic to see several of those gray assets 
enter the blue cash flowing bucket uh, in the near to mid term. Two key points I'd like to remind uh, shareholders and investors of, and Andrew spoke to this earlier, is the quality of operating partners that are driving forward these assets. Uh, David mentioned the 200 million in expiration spend, the significant investment by our operating partners going into these assets. All that benefit accrues to gold royalty at no cost, but also these key development stage assets that are being advanced, being developed, are in the hands of very well capitalized companies, which in our view, uh, is a significant de-risking factor relative to uh, to other peers. I'd also highlight, and it's quite timely within the royalty and streaming sector, our geopolitical profile with 80% of our portfolio in Quebec, Ontario, and Nevada, very stable and safe mining jurisdictions. And I'd note that our key development stage assets are on uh, brownfield sites uh, with, with very few assets subject to any meaningful permitting risk. These are assets that are being developed your existing operating mines, uh, and, and that that significantly again de-risks the development profile of our portfolio. Now, with 240 royalties, don't need to expand uh, across all of them, but a few of the specific highlights to bring to your attention. Uh, as always, our three cornerstone royalties royalties on three of the five largest gold mines in Canada are the USA, Odyssey, Cote, and Ren. Uh, we're quite excited and, and we've seen positive advancements at, at all of these assets. At Odyssey, uh, Canadian Malarctic continues its transition to become Canada's largest underground gold mine, uh, Ignico, with their most recent mine plan update uh, and recent exploration updates continue to emphasize the potential of the internal zones. While nothing definitive has been outlined or disclosed by Ignico, they do see the potential for the internal zones to supplement the underground mine plan uh, over the next couple of years. And beyond that, another key area of upside is the potential for a second shaft, uh, which could increase the underground mining throughput by 10 to 15,000 tons per day. This would be a meaningful contributor to the excess mill capacity that is at the Canadian Malarctic complex currently. For our royalty in 2024, we're expecting relatively modest, consistent revenue. We'll, we'll take a conservative view but do see that upside from the underground in the near term. Uh, as a reminder, Canadian Malarctic Complex really shifts to becoming a, a full underground mine towards 2028, where we'll see a meaningful step change in our royalty coverage. At Cote, the most immediate catalyst within the portfolio, uh, based on IM Gold's uh, Q4 results in 2024 guidance, they announced that IM Gold would achieve first gold pour imminently here uh, by the end of March, which is uh, where we're at, and then achieving commercial production in Q3 of 2024. Given this is the ramp up year, they've provided guidance of 220 to 290,000 ounces uh, in 2024 on 100% basis of the asset. Uh, while Cote within the mine plan ramps up closer to 500,000 ounces per year uh, once, once at full capacity. As a reminder of gold royalties coverage at Cote, our royalty covers zones five and seven of the patchwork of royalties at Cote, which is the southern portion of the pit. Importantly, mineralization at Cote is concentrated near surface and the higher grade portion of mineralization uh, is within our royalty coverage area. So we do expect to see an immediate benefit uh, as the royalty holder once this asset starts producing uh, in the very, very near term. At REN, uh, Barrick outlined their growth prospects last September, where they disclosed that REN was the subject of an internal pre-feasibility study, which they are targeting to publish uh, in early 2026, and then incorporating REN into the mine plan thereafter. They've continued their exploration efforts uh, through Q4. Some exciting drill results include 4.7 meters at 24.9 grams per tonne, at the Corona zone or, or the Corona corridor, that's the western portion of the property. So they're continuing to expand that resource, uh, get a better understanding of it, also advancing development and internal studies. So we're, we're quite bullish that this high grade resource close to seven grams per ton currently is going to be incorporated into the overall Carlin complex uh, later this decade. Now, beyond these cornerstone assets, pivoting to some of our most recent acquisitions and where they're standing. Uh, the most recent deal we closed is the Aura Minerals financing package where we received a 2% NSR royalty 
over the Borborema project in addition to a gold linked loan. In Aura's most recent quarterly results, they outlined that construction was 17% complete at Borborema and they maintain to be on track with first production in early 2025. In fact, February 2025 is, is their guidance. Uh, Aura is a proven mine builder within Brazil. The team that is currently constructing Borborema uh, just came off the successful completion of the Almas mine uh, on time and on budget. So we are quite confident in that team's ability to deliver at Borborema. As a reminder of our exposure at Borborema, we do receive those pre-production payments until they achieve technical completion uh, of a thousand gold equivalent ounces per year. And our coupon payment associated with the gold linked loan is 440 gold equivalent ounces per year. So while this is a development stage asset, we're already receiving 1,440 geos in 2024 or expect to. At Cozumel, uh, a relatively small mine within Capstone's portfolio, but a high grade, high margin operation with great exploration success and, and a track record that we would expect to continue into the future. In 2024, consistent with their previous mine plan and consistent with 2023, they'll look to have relatively similar production uh, with marginally higher costs, but uh, this is still a first quartile operation in terms of costs. Uh, we, we do expect continued exploration work at, at Cozumel as well to potentially extend the mine life. Uh, and, and this will be an asset that will be producing well beyond uh, the re reserve life in our view. And finally, our royalty at Granite Creek. Uh, reminder, this royalty was acquired uh, through a package of royalties from Nevada Gold Mines, uh, the joint venture between Barrick and Newmont. I-80 Gold, the operator, has had continued exploration success, extremely high grade drilling results at their South Pacific zone, which is the deeper area of mineralization at the underground of Granite Creek. Uh, this area is expected to be the main mining horizon in uh, 2024, and, and they're targeting to ramp up production here uh, to 1,000 tons per day. Our royalty at Granite Creek, the 10% net profit interest, is subject to 120,000 ounce production threshold. Uh, they've mined just shy of 10,000 ounces total to date. Uh, and once fully ramped up, we expect that, uh, that hurdle to be met quite quickly. So with those three cornerstone assets, three recent acquisitions, we've got a robust uh, growth profile in 2024 and out towards the end of the decade as well. With that, I'd pass it back to David to, to wrap things up, speak a bit about where we sit within the sector, uh, and then we can open things up for Q&A. Thanks, Peter. Thanks very much for that overview of our operations. Look, I, I think... Um, What's important to talk about is where we're positioned relative to our peers in the sector. And, and as you've heard me say before, there are two distinct solitudes in our sector. There's the large cap universe, the wheat and precious metals, Franco Nevada's Royal Golds, all exceptional large cap liquid companies with great royalty portfolios. But what they lack is growth. What we provide is an opportunity to grow significantly, even exponentially, off of a very strong and diversified portfolio. One, in terms of our scale, that's actually comparable to the seniors in the space uh, in some of the best royalty uh, opportunities in North America. We have royalties on three of the five biggest producing gold mines in North America, uh, including Canadian Malartic, uh, Cote, and also the underground extension of Gold Strike and Wren. So that provides a quality proposition in addition to the significant diversification we have within those three principal jurisdictions in Nevada, Quebec, and Ontario. And now in Brazil with the Borborema asset, which will be uh, coming into production in early 2025, but also already contributing, as I should say, pre-production royalty revenue over the course of 2024. So exceptional growth in the best jurisdictions from a well-diversified portfolio, but with foundational assets, cornerstone assets that will be delivering royalties for our shareholders for many decades to come. So to sum up, and, and again, thank you for your kind attention. We'll take questions shortly. Uh, the royalty model is the superior model in order to participate in an unmitigated basis to leverage in the gold price. Uh, we're protecting our shareholders from cost inflation as a result of our top line revenue exposure. Uh, we have diversification that no operating company can hope to achieve with over 240 royalties across the portfolio and across the life cycle of a mine from production right up to early stage uh, exploration. We provide a lot of optionality in addition to that revenue growth. 
as the gold price goes up, that option value will start to be crystallized in the marketplace in our view. And also, again, free expiration upside as a result of the expiration efforts of our 80 plus royalty operators or, or operating companies within our royalty portfolio that invest significantly in expiration around their existing mines and deposits in order to achieve uh, reserve and resource upside, which we benefit from in our royalty portfolio without actually having to contribute to it. But I think what's also important about our story, uh, and it's quite unique among the royalty players, even the large cap players, is we have four distinct legs of growth, uh, which none of the royalty companies in our space do. And that includes M&A, which we did uh, quite aggressively in the course of 2021. We had much stronger currency. Uh, we IPO to $5 per share, and we had strong currency over the course of 2021. We recognized our relative multiple advantage, and we used it uh, to the advantage of our shareholders to accumulate significant critical mass and diversification through M&A efforts as we acquired three companies. When the currency abandoned us, as the Federal Reserve started to tighten interest rates in early 2021, or 22, I should, I should say, uh, we started to look at other means of growth, and that included uh, third-party royalty acquisition, as we did with Cote. We bought that from the estate of a deceased prospector, and that's going to deliver significant revenue growth for us this year. We did through project financing as well, as we did recently with uh, Ora Minerals and the Berberama Project in Brazil. And then we also generate royalties organically through our efforts, principally in Nevada, where Jerry Boffman runs our U.S. business. He stakes expiration claims around existing mines and deposits and generates royalties, not only for free, we actually get option payments for the royalties we generate as we farm those properties out to the operators and explorers. Last year alone, we generated almost $3 million of option revenue through our royalty generator model. And we generate two to three royalties per quarter doing that. Again, not, not only for free, but we actually get paid to generate those royalties. No other company in the royalty universe grows through all four means. And I think that's a testament to the depth and breadth of our management team, which collectively has over 400 years of industry experience. That gives us the advantage of being able to grow through multiple means and access royalty opportunities through leveraging our, our relationships in the industry. So with that, uh, Joanne, we'd be delighted to take questions from our shareholders. Excellent. First of all, thank you, gentlemen, for a fantastic update. We really have a global full house audience today. So thank you to the audience for tuning in this morning. It really means a lot to us. Before we take questions, just a reminder to please place your questions into the Q&A tab located at the top of your screens. And the first question for today is, David, if possible, could you please comment on the Arizona Metals K deposit in Arizona, which is approximately 45% gold, 45% copper, and still drilling? Uh, just curious if you have any opinion on them. D David, just to, to get ahead of you on that. So we we don't have a royalty over ah. uh, Arizona Metals K deposit. It is, it's an interesting deposit. We we know the Arizona Metals team. Um, but from our perspective, it, it's interesting. We don't have a royalty. Um, wish the Arizona Metals team the best. But um, it's not something within our portfolio. All right. Well, then that's been answered. Um and I think, you know, there's been questions regarding the royalty generation model, which you answered and summed up in, in the last part of your presentation, David. So I, I think we've answered that question. Um, so next question, how many of your projects will become producers within this gold cycle? Peter? Yep. Uh so currently with, with six, six cash flowing assets, we do see several assets ramping up and entering production. Named a few already, uh, Wren, Odyssey, Granite Creek. Uh, other potential development stage assets include Gold Rock. So we're, we're approaching 10 to a dozen uh, producing royalties uh, by the end of the decade, if that's how you want to define this gold cycle. Okay. Uh, questions on Cote. Are they on track for production and ramp up in 2024? Yeah, so based on all information, and as I noted uh, from I Am Gold, uh, they've indicated production by the end of March, which is imminent, and really ramping up to commercial production in the second half of the year in Q3. I think the one thing that gives me significant comfort um, as a royalty holder is the fact that they have 5 million tons 
of ore stockpiled, ready to go into the mill. And I think that's extremely important. Having been a mine developer myself over my career, having a consistent feed of ore during the commissioning phase is extremely important to optimize uh, the metallurgical recoveries and get a consistent uh, production level from uh, the operation. So they've done an exceptional job in that regard. And that gives me some confidence that they'll have a relatively smooth ramp up. Thank you. Um, lots of questions on the dividend. Uh, do you foresee re reintroducing uh, or entering back into the dividend phase? Look, I think as we get into free cash flow territory and sustainable free cash flow, it's a conversation that I, might, I know my board would be delighted to have in terms of returning capital to shareholders on a consistent basis. So uh, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but we are entering into free cash flow territory uh, this year, uh, which is a great place to be. Thank you, David. Uh, in regards to Barbarema uh, advancing, is February 2025 production realistic, feasible? Uh, definitely. Based based on Aura's track record as, as a Latin American operator, we're quite confident that we'll see that asset enter production early next year. But given how we've structured that investment as well, we're significantly de-risked on if there was a delay. We, we're still receiving 250 gold equivalent ounces per quarter until they enter production. Uh, so we do see an increase once they enter production, but we've got very reliable cash flows up to a maximum of 10 years if that asset was never built, which is, is not the case, but we've we've really protected ourselves on the downside with, with the structuring. And the, the other component of that, about a third of the financing we provided was in the form of our convertible debenture, which actually generates interest during the pre-production phase. And that, that debenture is convertible into an additional royalty on the property. So as they ramp it up and we gain confidence in the underlying operation, as they start to convert that significant resource over 2 million ounces in the reserve and extend the mine life, then it'll make a lot of sense for us to convert that, uh, that debenture into an additional royalty over and above uh, the initial royalty that we have. Excellent. Next question, cost savings. Uh, where did the majority of cost savings come from in 2023 versus 2022? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, so the majority of savings, it came from a few different areas. First and foremost, um, I mentioned in the presentation, we, we came off a couple years of, of fairly high pace growth, corporate consolidation, and 2023 was a year whereby um, we removed um, some duplica duplication, which came into the, the company, and, and that was in the form of administrative functions and associated office costs related to primarily the Ely, Golden Valley, and Abitibi acquisitions. Um, further to that, um, over the course of the year since I became CFO, we've we've established um, uh, more of a streamlined FP&A function to really evaluate um, and monitor our, our G&A costs. And, and that allowed us to, to focus on you know, the highest value add services, as well as review um, service contracts and make improvements where, where we could. And we, we started down that track through, uh, through 2023. Uh, and then lastly, um, the, th the third area was really, um, we have seen a reduction in some of the professional fees. And in 2023, we did take on a little more in-house in um, from a technical review standpoint, supplementing the team that reviews projects as well as uh, in the finance team in particular. Um, so really centralization of of our operating um, uh, footprint within our Vancouver office. Excellent. Um, question on evaluating future growth opportunities. How is the company doing that? We've never been busier. We're in a perpetual state of due diligence. That's that's our business. Um, there is such a dearth of capital for development stage assets, even expansions of existing operations, that we're seeing more and more uh, companies, whether they're at the operating stage, development stage, or exploration stage, starting to incorporate streams and royalties into their capital structure uh, more consistently. That means we're getting an influx of opportunities thrown our way. But we have a very, very heavy screen. Uh, since our IPO, we've looked at over 300 opportunities. Wow. We've only executed on eight, including the M&A deals we've done. So we're very, very choosy about the things that we invest in and uh, write royalties on because we have very stringent rate of return criteria. Hmm. Excellent. 
Um, David, do you expect, you know, speaking on the sector, do you expect more consolidation within the mid-tier royalty space in the near future? What, do you, yeah. what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think there's definitely going to be a, a, a continued consolidation on the producer side. Um, and, and there has been significant consolidation, big, small, and medium. Big being Newmont, Newcrest being the biggest ever uh, since the Newmont Gold Corp merger back in 2019. That was uh, th This one was over $50 billion. And then we've seen smaller ones, like uh, recently Argonaut being taken over by Alamos and, and uh, Calibre taking over a, a project, Marathon's project in Newfoundland. That'll continue to happen because, as I said, with the lack of expiration occurring in the sector, uh, the seniors have to take out other companies in order to maintain unsustainable production profiles. They're kind of caught in this vicious cycle and have been for, for decades, and I don't think that's going to reverse. So given the lack of expiration, continued deterioration, the reserve uh, profile of the industry, they have to, they have to basically pay Pac-Man with each other. Uh, on, on the royalty side, I see lots of scope for consolidation. Um, uh, there's probably too many players in the small cap universe, and there's a complete absence of a mid-tier competitor in the royalty space, which is big enough to be relevant to institutional investors, generalists that come into the space, but still small enough to grow. Uh, and so there is no $5 billion market cap royalty player out there. The absence of that, to me, is a void that needs to be filled. I think you're going to see consolidation among the smaller cap players to enhance their multiple and drive down their cost of capital. The the, uh, the order of that, the sequencing of that is hard to predict, but I think it's inevitable because it's such an economic imperative for the smaller cap universe. Excellent. Uh, regarding your Granite Creek project, uh, was was that a net profit royalty rather than an NSR? Can you provide clarity on that, please? Yeah, no, it's it's a good question and uh, good to provide clarity. So it is a net profit royalty that we have at Granite Creek, and it's one of the, the few net profit bottom line royalties we have in our portfolio. The reason we got really excited about this royalty in particular was the grade of the underground and, and the potential for a very high margin deposit uh, with I-80, bringing that asset forward. Uh, the current underground resource is over 11 grams per ton, and the continued exploration success of the South Pacific Zone could could see that expand and, and potentially improve as well. So because of the potential for a high-grade, high-margin deposit here, it, it was one of the rare occasions where we, we did find the net profit interest uh, quite attractive. But I would note that the vast majority of our portfolio uh, there's only a handful, uh, only a couple actual net profit interests. Almost all of our royalties are top line net smelter return royalties or gross revenue royalties. Okay. And what are your plans for the cash generated in 2024? Do you have any preferences? No, look, I, I think, um, as I said earlier, uh, returning capital to shareholders is something that's definitely on the table that we'll discuss as we get into sustainable free cash flow. Uh, but we're looking at uh, a, a significant uh, number of opportunities that will help us grow our business accretively. And putting that cash to work, I think, is a priority. Excellent. And David, there's been a number of questions um, regarding the share price and performance, and perhaps you can comment on that. Well, we've had a very good start in, in the year. We've certainly been a relative outperformer, a dramatic relative outperformer to the sector. And I think that's really a testament to the fact that we're we're pivoting into free cash flow territory. As I said, we had our first quarter of positive uh, adjusted earnings in the fourth quarter of last year, um, and that we're poised to deliver positive earnings and positive free cash flow going forward. And I think the market recognizes that, that we have uh, unparalleled growth in the sector. Excellent. Well, um, we are at the top of the hour. So we will end the Q&A session at this time. And if you have any other questions, please forward them directly to Peter at pbenke at goldroyalty.com. David, before we sign off, would you like to say a few more words uh, to this great audience today? Well, thank you so much for, for such uh, incredible participation today for your questions. And uh, as Joanne says, you don't need to end your questioning today. We're easily accessible through uh, our, our website, through our emails or phone um, phone numbers. If you go to our website, you can see how we can contact us. And if you have any follow-up questions, we're delighted to hear from you. Thank you, David. And thank you, team.
Just a reminder that this town hall will be available on Gold Royalty's website and across all of our socials within the next 24 hours. Before we sign off, please ensure that you fill in the short questionnaire at the end of the presentation. This really helps us and the company communicate more effectively with you in the future. Thank you for joining us today, and we will see you all on the next town hall forum. Goodbye. Thank you.